Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I got a little confused myself here. <laughs> Having a major storm here in the desert. So hello and welcome. My name is Jason Levine, aka Beetle Jace. Very nice to see you on this stormy Friday for me. And we're here to do uh, episode 14 of Audio 101. So give me one second here just to configure a couple of things. All right. Today, I thought we would actually cover something now that now that I've taken you through all the, basically all the steps to do everything you really need to do in audio from basic recording your voice to editing, editing in the waveform view, editing spectrally, adding delay based effects, compression, limiting, EQ, mastering, uh, delay based effects, surround mixing, multi track mixing, multi track recording. I mean, there's still more things to cover, but now you kind of have all the all the tools in your toolbox to really create some pretty awesome audio. But the last thing and the thing that I realized that I hadn't really covered yet was how to basically do all the final checks and all the final preparation to deliver that audio to whatever to wherever that destination may be. So as the title suggests, I'm going to focus largely on things like uh, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, YouTube, but ultimately the same processes apply basically across the board. So no matter where you're going, these are these are all steps that you should take to just ensure that whatever you're delivering is is legit. All right. So on that note, let's uh, let's get started. And we're going to start. I actually made uh, one of my <laughs> one of my amazing lists here. And by the way, I should mention that uh, I am in the desert. It looks like we're having a monsoon. The darkness that you see here is <laughs> the sky is black right now. So this could all go down. Just just be aware. All right. I could lose <laughs> lose power and everything else. So we better work fast. All right. So editing and prepping your audio for iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. All right. And every and everywhere else and useful effects tips. So the first thing we're gonna cover here is topping and tailing, and then you'll see I'll go into channel mixer for rebalancing. Normalizing, ambience and space, loudness and volume matching, loudness metering, and then metadata. So we're going to start with topping and tailing, also known as fix the click and leveraging our fade and gain envelopes. So when you have your audio and you're sort of ready to finalize it for delivery, um, you want to check all these basic little things like what does it sound like when the audio starts? What does it sound like when the audio stops? And when you're using um, apps like Spotify or iTunes or even YouTube in a playlist, um, as you're sort of going between the tracks, and especially in the case of Spotify and iTunes where you can crossfade between tracks, um, you might notice occasionally that sometimes you might even hear a little click. So let's take a listen. I'm going to kill the music behind me. This is a track of me and Mr. Fuzzy Island recorded uh, quite some time ago. And... One of the things in Audition is, if you're doing all of your editing here, as you're actually cutting and editing, we have a function that basically says if you've got uh, transitional edit points, uh, or rather if you're just cutting in the middle of a track or even deleting something out of a track, basically we have a, we have a fail safe function that will prevent you from incurring um, any kind of click or pop at the edit point. And it's a function in the preferences called smooth uh, smooth edit and cut boundaries. So this is very useful because this will prevent anything uh, like a pop or click from happening. Okay. Now, having said that, uh, most of your stuff may not come from Audition. And a lot of times, especially if you're using external recorders, maybe you're again coming from another software, it's not uncommon, especially if you're cutting things out or mixing things down in the middle of a track, like if you're using a live take of a recording, You've got the whole count in and all the talking before the song begins. Wherever you start cutting and editing and finishing, you might have, um, you might end up with a little pop or click towards the beginning or the end of the file. So I want to take, a, give you a listen to this and let you hear what this sounds like. And you're just going to hear a little, little at the transition there. And you can actually see it right here, right at the end. Just however this was cut, maybe it was lifting up a cable or something. There was just this little, this little right there at the very end, and if we look at the beginning here too, uh, there's something else going on there too. So however this got clipped out, there's some little pop and click. So listen carefully at the little transition here. I've got this in a loop playback mode so you can hear what's happening. Ooh, fantastic thunder, you're missing it. All right, here we go, listen for the click.
So I don't know if you could hear that little, that little sort of snap, click, pop there, but this is something that you do not want to leave. You don't want to leave that when you go off and publish this out to, again, YouTube, to publish it out to iTunes or Spotify, particularly if you're going to be batching a whole bunch of tracks. You don't want to send something with these kinds of little pops and clicks. So we're going to perform what's known as a top and tail, which is basically where you do a very quick fade in and or fade out at the beginning and end of the file. So the best way to do that here is just you can grab your horizontal, I don't even remember what this is called anymore, portion bar, portion selector, horizontal zoom scrubby thing, I don't even know. You can zoom in all the way to the end here. And then I'm right click zooming on the timeline just to get me a little bit further down, almost down to sample level. So now we're looking at individual samples. And I can grab this on clip fade tool and just very quickly do a fade in, all right? like this. And it can be across, you can see, I can even do the fade in across as few as, you know, two, three samples just to fix that little click. And again, you can see here at the end of the waveform, right, it's not crossing that, that, that zero boundary there. This is why we're getting that little pop or click. And you're going to see this on a lot of, especially if you're compiling things, maybe they, they've come from compressed sources like MP3. <laughs> I can't see. There's a dust storm now. You can't see anything outside. And there's a lot of lightning. Okay. So um, so let's go ahead and do the same thing here. We're going to fade this out. And again, what's nice about this is that you get a visual representation of what's happening. And it only needs to be a couple of milliseconds in duration. All right. What am I saying? It only needs to be a couple of samples in duration. So now when we play this back, again, I'll mute this. Not that you're going to hear it necessarily, but take a listen. All right, so it's clean, there's no click, there's no pop, there's no anything. So this is something that you should always do uh, if you're transferring vinyl. This is something that I do. Now, I don't repair all the clicks and pops that are inherent on a vinyl surface, um, but as you're transitioning between tracks, particularly when I bring them into iTunes so I can listen to my vinyl library, you want to do a little top and tail at the beginning and end of each track, just so that you don't incur some kind of pop or click or something that just, it just breaks the whole mood and it's unprofessional, so you don't want that. So that's called topping and tailing. Now outside of using these on-clip fade handles, sometimes you need to get a little more crafty with the type of fade that you want, and that's where you can use something like the fade envelope. So let's say if I wanted to take this section right here, now this is nothing, this is just like background noise, but let's just say I wanted to carve out a little bit more interesting fade. Sometimes you need to do these things in the middle of a track. It's not uncommon that this occurs in multiple locations. With the fade envelope, you've got a whole series of different uh, fade options. So you see it's got, right now it's doing a fade out. All right, I don't know if you can see those yellow lines if they're coming through quick, uh, clearly. You'll also notice right here, I don't know if that can be seen. Zoom in real good. There you go. Yeah, you, you can see it. Um, we've got keyframes. So you're actually drawing the curve uh, right on the canvas. Now, if I went to something like a smooth fade in, this will show you what it looks like. I can also grab these edit points and even click on the uh, fade handles and add more points to really customize the shape of the fade, okay? And this can also be saved as a preset here, okay? And you see I've got it in spline curve mode. That would be the equivalent uh, of using Bezier's, okay? So spline, Bezier, same thing in, uh, in audio terms here. So you can really customize the fade at the beginning or end, or again, sometimes, even inside of a track, you might have an area where you just want to very quickly dip something down and fade it back up, maybe at the beginning right here. Maybe I had a little bit of a, a plosive or something that just caused a little, and I didn't really like it very much. Um, you can go back into the fade envelope, and again, you can kind of customize exactly how you want that to sound. Wow. If we go into something like our bell curve here, you can see, again, zigzag cuts. I mean, they've got some pretty weird, you know, you can, you can get pretty specific. You get the idea. Tremors, that's good for right now. You can customize and draw um, the exact kind of fade you want. This is something which I've often used, like, in the middle, where I'm trying to do sort of fade something out, and then maybe there was just a little... Oh, I keep hitting this coffee right here. Maybe there was something 
right down there that I just didn't like. So I kind of fade out one section and fade back in. And ultimately, I smooth out this little transition right here. So you can very easily customize the fade uh, with your fade envelope. Now similarly, you'll notice we also have the gain envelope here, okay? And again, you'll see a lot of the same, same styled presets here. The only difference is, is that this actually allows you to boost gain, okay? So whereas before you're kind of starting with whatever amplitude it is and just fading in and out, this actually allows you to modify the actual on-clip gain. So, and you can see we've even got some presets here for a plus three hard bump. And again, as we zoom in and look at the keyframe values here, right? So this would be zero right here. This keyframe represents a plus three bump in amplitude, okay? So that's the only difference between the fade and the gain envelope. Theoretically, you, you draw them, you construct them the same way. It's just that the gain envelope actually allows you to add gain, which again is no different than if I made a selection like this and just said increase this by 3 dB. The difference is, is that this is doing a ramp up and a ramp back down, okay? So you're, you're, you're enveloping, you're actually constructing how the amplitude gets added over time. Is it Halloween already? It ought to be. <laughs> I said to a friend, I was actually planning on doing the stream one day this week or next week um, in my Halloween costume. I'm going as Alice Cooper this year. <laughs> so, anyway, but it didn't happen today. Would have been a good day for it. Actually, it would have been too dark. I would have had the black makeup on. You, would, you wouldn't have seen, you would have seen my nose, and that's about it. Okay, so that's topping and tailing, gain envelope, fade envelope. Perfect. And we're 17 minutes in. I've already spilled my coffee once. All right, next, channel mixer and central channel extractor for rebalancing. Okay, so very commonly um, when you're playing back your tracks, again, before you publish them out, you want to listen and you want to check and make sure that everything is sort of where it's supposed to be. I was talking on Monday during our mastering session about the overuse of stereo expansion or stereo expander effects. These are the kind of things that you want to check for. Or if you're doing a live to two recording, let's say you're recording something like a podcast or multiple people on mic, before you go out and publish, you want to listen and you want to very carefully be aware of like the center, the balance of the stereo. And sometimes, especially if you're recording live to two or you've done something destructively where you can't go back and remix individual elements, things may be or appear to be a little imbalanced. And while I talked about how mastering can kind of even out imbalances, if your stereo image is very imbalanced, mastering alone is not going to fix that. There, there's, some other, there's some other techniques that you can implement to kind of rebalance or kind of correct the stereo. So I just wanted to show you and give you an idea of where you can find uh, some of those various um, elements here. Oh, and by the way, this is another, this was a, a, a mix. You're probably not gonna hear this. Let's take a listen here. Yeah, you can barely hear it. This was the instrumental mix uh, that we have worked on last week, which we're going to work on in the second half of today. Carry on. There's no vocals on this, but there was a little click at the edit there, too. <laughs> Sounds pretty tight. Okay, so uh, rebalancing. And actually, this isn't a bad one. We can use this for rebalancing. So let's go up to effects, amplitude, and compression, channel mixer. Now, again, I'm just pointing this out here to showcase to you where you can find all of these things because these are common processes that you actually implement a lot in video editing, um, not only just for deploying to Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, whatever. So one of the things that you can do, and this can work no matter where the file's coming from. This, is, this actual channel mixer can be very useful if you're trying to repair or fix camera recorded audio, so audio that's actually captured on a mirrorless or DSLR camera or even on your iPhone, where you might have one channel that's very quiet or just kind of the bleed from the main channel and there's you know a, a 10 or 15 20 decibel difference so one of the things is you've got all these different presets in here that will allow you to reconfigure the mix of the channels so for instance here we can have everything all channels to 50 percent which means that in both left and right you're going to equally hear 50% of what the right channel was and 50% of what the left channel was, okay? So you can like take a quick listen. So here's before. I'm gonna pull up our phase analysis too. Okay, 
So by having everything 50% in the left and right, what is that doing? It's turning it mono, right? Stereo. You can really hear that bass. Now this is also just a good process to check for mono compatibility, by the way, which you can of course do uh, in the uh, in the multi-track as well. You'll even see here now these settings that you'll see all these down mix settings. These are the kind of things that you would often use uh, to test multi-channel fold downs and down mixing. And you can see here like it's got the left and right uh, all, all coming out of the channel one, which would be left front mono. That's why there's nothing in the right side. So this is all going to be confined just to one channel there, okay? down next to stereo. This is already stereo. So this would be the kind of thing that you would use if you were working on an, a 5.1 or a multi-channel interleaved file. You can down mix to a matrix stereo. Now again, for video users, fill left, fill right. This is very common where you might have only content in one channel and you want to fill the other with the existing content. So if you've got stuff in the right but nothing in the left, you can fill the left with the right fill the right with the left, et cetera, et cetera. You can see here these, uh, these presets here related to uh, broadcast 5.1 content, mid-side stereo to mid-side, mid-side to stereo. So this is a very common um, stereo miking technique. You can actually see here on the right channel we've inverted the phase. Um, you can take a regular stereo recording and convert it into mid-side. This is often used for multiple broadcast applications. We've got a preset. Let's take a little listen to that. So here's converted to mid-side. Okay, uh, and you get the idea. So you've got, and you can see even converting, <laughs> converting to ambisonic formats and such. A um, lot of different presets, a lot of different ways to reconfigure the stereo balance with a channel mixer. Now, I talked about relocating or moving the center channel information. So this is another, another area where you can get uh, very creative with how you, um, how you kind of fix things and move things around after the fact when you're confined to a stereo or mono file. Gain it, exactly. So um, if we go into effects, stereo imagery, center channel extractor, Here's where, now again, I've talked about using this. In fact, this was in one of those special episodes. I think it was between episode 12 and 13. How you can use this effect for um, removing vocals or keeping vocals and removing music, so creating an acapella. Um, this can also be used uh, just uh, on the surface to just do a little bit of channel rebalancing, okay? Or maybe just refocusing the center. So let's go to... Um, See, what is our default? I don't even know what the default setting is here. Okay, so yeah, I don't want any removal just yet. So let's set these to zero. Okay, we're not, we're not going to do any particular extraction, but you can see that you've got options here where you can actually extract specific channels based on the actual phase angle, and then you can implement the necessary delays, frequency range, etc. Um, I've also got some advanced settings here with regard to FFT size. You see this, we've talked about this ad infinitum used all over. Uh, the number of overlays when you're doing things like vocal removal or vocal keeping, the number of overlays um, ultimately determines kind of that, the quality based on the number of FFT slices that you're using to do the removal or attenuation. But for us here, what we're really gonna focus on are these two sliders here, the center channel level and the side channel levels. Because again, just on the surface, we just take a listen here. So again, when I turn this on or off, I'm not doing any adjustments. Nothing is changing. But if I wanted to bring some of that center channel information up. Now this, this file, by the way, is super, super compressed. So what I might do, just before I go in here, I'm just going to grab my on-clip volume uh, and give myself a little bit of headroom because you can see it was just peaking like crazy. Let's go back up to our stereo imagery here. All right, and let's play this back again. All right, let's wait till the vocals come in. Here we go. Okay, 
So, and you're seeing that as I'm adjusting this slider, I can really make it seem as if I'm pulling those vocals out a little bit more, right? Now, whereas in the channel mixer, I could add back in <clears throat> more amplitude on the left side. And by the way, you saw those sliders. You can adjust in dB, in percentage, um, how much more or less of the left and right you're rebalancing. You can do the same with the center. You can also do the same with the side channels. So if I wanted to kind of make this a little less wide um, or accentuate what's on the sides, So you can use the center channel extractor to also allow you to do additional rebalancing, all right? Very useful, something to keep in mind before you deliver, especially if you're unhappy with the stereo. Okay, normalization, normalizing. Now this is something that people ask me about all the time. And this is one of those things that you must perform before, before you finalize these last few steps that I'm gonna show you. A normalization is basically the ability to look at the loudest peak of a file, the very loudest singular, transient, whatever that sound is, and adjust up or down everything based on that loudest peak. Now, before you normalize anything, you need to know what are the attributes of the file in the first place. So if you go over to Amplitude Statistics, okay, and if we run scan, it's gonna look at this entire file. Make this a little bit bigger here. All right, you'll actually see the peak amplitudes and everything that you need to know about this. So right here, this file, which by the way was an MP3 that I created a really long time ago, this is more than a dB above zero. There's all kinds of clipped samples. In fact, on the left channel alone, there's over 12,000 clipped samples. So this is telling you everything about this file, the maximum RMS, the average RMS. By the way, this was recorded on, uh, on DA88 and transferred digitally. You can see that on those early digital recordings, really making use of the dynamic range here, which is very, very cool and very impressive. And you don't see that quite so much in today's recordings. A lot of dynamic range leveraged um, and still super, super loud when it comes to the maximum RMS. And here's our output program loudness based on the ITU BS1770 standard there for broadcast. So if I wanted to normalize this, I wanna normalize this down, right? This has, this has clipped samples, this has things that are distorting technically. You want to you want to be sure that you normalize below 0 before you deliver your audio anywhere. Okay? And this is the actual it's funny. I hadn't actually ever analyzed this particular file. As I said this was made a long time ago. I don't know what encoder I used, but I mean crazy. I would never deliver this to iTunes this way because lord knows what might happen. And I wouldn't deliver an MP3 to iTunes anyway, but you get the idea. So under effects amplitude compression normalize here is where you can determine what you normalize to. Now, as I've said many, many times, your ear does not perceive any change in volume. Le if, it's, if it's less than a dB and a half, you, you don't hear it, you don't perceive it. Right around 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 decibels of change, that's where you start to perceive a difference. But if you change something by one decibel, you really, d especially when we're talking about loudness at this level, you're not gonna perceive a change. Now having said that, that doesn't mean that you wanna still sacrifice, <laughs> you know, a whole decibel. So typically for mastering for Spotify and iTunes, I will generally go to around either minus 0.5 or minus 0.7, okay? Giving myself, you know, three tenths or seven tenths of a dB just below zero dB, just below clipping. Because, uh, now you're gonna submit, generally you're going to submit um, uncompressed wave files and things like that to music services. But for YouTube and everything, you're already submitting compressed audio. So really you can go like minus 0.3 if you must. A lot of that is gonna have to do with how you've mastered your track. You may still end up with some uh, clipped samples in the end, but it doesn't really matter because the codecs and the way that they're delivered today, it's going to be okay. That was really more of a problem when we were dealing with physical discs because DVD and CDR media, they don't like clipped samples. And when you have one burned to a disc, that one and zero gets interpreted as digital noise. So it was really far more destructive when we were dealing with physical platters in the non-physical non, non 
physical distribution of audio, you can have some clip samples and it's and it's okay. I'm not recommending that you leave any there. I'm just saying that it's it's more common than it's uncommon today. So now that I've done that normalization, if I go ahead and scan, is that track information always there in a general tab? How do you open that? Uh, yes, yeah, so no, it's um, amplitude statistics. You'll find it under the window menu if it's not, and it is not open nor docked by default. So you'll want to open up this panel right here. All right, that's the one that you'll want to use. Very cool. Okay. So, um, and now you can see our peak amplitude. All right, minus 0.7 on the left. Again, your left and right might not be exactly the same. Don't freak out if you don't see minus 0.7, minus 0.7. That's also telling me that my mastering, while I was mastering quite hot, um, there's still a little bit of dynamic change in here, and the left and right are, you know, within a tenth of a dB, right? And that's totally fine. And actually, when you go into sort of the maximum and the averages of loudness, I mean, you can see here, again, 0.7 dB difference. Your ear, you don't, you don't, you're not going to perceive like, oh, the stereo is so off. I wouldn't have tried to have fixed that, right, for, for less than half a dB here, okay? So all looking good, everything looking good. All right, and you can see, okay, now we're within legal limits, no clip samples, this is ready to go. And this is something that you're going to want to do on every file before you submit it. Now, keep in mind as well that when you look at something like this, so this is a track, this is that fuzzy track again, this is very dynamic. This was not mastered with that kind of slam, slam style limiting. Right? There's a lot of breathing room in here. So when you look at the statistics of this, this already has a peak amplitude, look here, of minus 0.13, minus 0.27. So while there aren't any clipped samples, while you know this is still totally legit in terms of like it's not clipping, it's fine, um, it's still too hot based on what I just said. Like I wouldn't want to deliver something where there's only you know a tenth of a dB of headroom. That's just it's not quite enough. You're just you're you're leaving you're leaving possibility for for issues further on later. So again, here, because we know that the loudest peak is minus 0.13, we want to get that down about a half a decibel, okay? Which is going to bring the right side down that same half a decibel. And that's something to keep in mind. Normalization is not affecting the dynamic relationships. It's not, it's not like adding compression or limiting. It's not adjusting peaks or anything based on like how fast they hit a threshold. It's looking at the loudest peak and then based on what amount you tell it, it's either boosting or attenuating everything by that same amount, okay? So we need to kind of cut everything back about a half a dB. So once again, I'll go into amplitude compression here. We can go to minus seven. All right, minus 0.7, not minus seven. Apply it. Visually, it looks very different, you know, doesn't look much different. Rescan the selection and same thing, just as with that other file, minus 0.7 here on the left. And there's about a 0.15 dB difference between the left and right. No problem, that's fine, okay? And you can see all the other attributes here, all right? So now this is normalized, it's within the limits that I want. Now, what's the next thing I've got on here? Oh, ambience and space, okay, and then we get to loudness matching. So we're gonna come back to this because just because I've normalized everything to the same level, of course, um, that doesn't mean that they're going to sound the same. In other words, they're not going to have the same perceived loudness. Right, you heard that Silver Stripes track, it's really loud, right? Really compressed. You're gonna get to this, and this is gonna sound hey, hey, John. Hey, hey, uh, nice. kind of acoustic and quiet. Oh, this is, oh, sorry, this is a commercial. <laughs> this is an old commercial that I did for Centrillium. Not, uh, I just saw the long name, I assumed it was the fuzzy track. The recordings are hissy mm. and they sound terrible, mm -hmm. and I just spent $100 to get the darn thing fixed. All right, it's just a totally different piece of music. So let's um, go to space and ambience here. Now, the reason I bring this up uh, adding ambient reverb, ambi a little bit of space, is not uncommon before mastering, particularly if you've got something like, you know, dialogue or talking, or if you're compiling a series of maybe uh, voiceovers or commercials or things that you've done that might be clean and dry. It, it can sometimes be nice to add just a little bit of ambience to give a little bit of dimension to your recordings. And if you're trying to make a compilation of things, by adding a little um, global ambient reverb, and I mean a very small, reflective, slightly reflective room type ambience. This is nothing where you're gonna have any sort of long decay as if my voice was in a hall, nothing like that. Just something to put everything in a, in a space and importantly, in the same space. This can also help to kind of homogenize and 
just kind of glue things together. All of these recordings that I have here were recorded in different places, at different times, in different years, on different equipment. They are not, go and, and mixed all in audition at some point, but just different times, different, different uh, hardware, different plugins. These are not going to sound the same. But if I'm trying to compile all these things together, sometimes, based on the content, doesn't mean just do it, you might want to add a little bit of ambient reverb just to kind of give everything and put everything in the same space. So if we take a, a quick listen, let me see if I can go to something that might, this might actually do it. Okay, now this is again a fat, big, heavily limited track. Um, it's got a lot of its own reverb and ambient effects. If I go up to effects, reverb, studio reverb, there's two presets in here which I created a long, long time ago which will be available to you, room ambience one and two. Um, that will do just that. They're going to basically place you in a, in a sort of ambient, spatial environment. Now, you'll look, you'll see ambient one has a decay of a thousand milliseconds. That's, that's one second decay. Um, but there's very little wet signal here, and um, there's about 50% early reflection. That doesn't mean that you're actually going to hear the room have this sort of one second echo. It's just the overall decay of the room has the capability of being one second if you were to go 100% wet, which you never do, and you wouldn't do for any kind of ambient use. You're solely using this to basically put something in a particular kind of environment. And you can actually hear what that environment sounds like and customize that as you're playing back. Now, I happen to like Ambience 2. It's rolling off a little bit more of the high end here all right, so it's gonna be a little bit warmer. If you're trying to brighten things up though, you want that high frequency cut to be a little bit higher. So I'm gonna to go to ambience one, and I'm actually going to adjust the decay to around 1600 milliseconds. I'll keep the room size at about 50, and if I wanna hear what this actually sounds like, let's listen to 100% wet and 0% dry. All right, and you can hear it kinda of sounds like just kind of a nice, a nice room. Okay, now we can adjust the decay. See, we don't want, we don't want 3,000, right? We want it small. And you know, and maybe, maybe 1,200, maybe around 1,187, that's just about right. Reflections, again, this is gonna add a little bit more brightness and kind of reflective clarity. You don't want, you wanna be a little, little careful with this. Width, this is just whether or not you want to add additional sort of stereo widening. Um, that's entirely up to you. And then you can play around with the high frequency cut here to see. You'll notice it's 6220. It's doing nothing for this track. It's actually making it sound a little more muddy. So to bring everything into kind of a brighter, more clear sounding environment, we probably want that high frequency cut above 8K. That's going to be largely dependent on the content that you're trying to place this audio in. But just keep that in mind. And then you've got um, options here. We talked about this when we were just discussing reverb for damping and diffusion. I don't want to use too much of this because again, I'm just placing a little bit and I'm probably only going to use up to around 20%. So now that we're listening to this 100% wet, let's go ahead and bring the dry signal back. Turn off all the wet signal. Now, do you hear that right now? That's as much room as we're adding. Before. It just kind of opens it up a little. Now, you'd have to use careful listening. I've got my mic on. You're hearing all this ambient noise, <coughs> ambient noise with me. It's going to be a little hard to hear right now. But that's about the amount that you want to use. About no more than 20%, give or take a few percent. And you want your decay to be probably sub 1600 milliseconds with sort of a medium sized room. All right, and this is just going to allow you to basically place everything in a similar environment, okay? Not recommended for all audio, not recommended for all compilations. It's just a good way, if you've got things that are really different sounding and you're trying to find one way to kind of make them somewhat similar, ambient or spatial reverb with a very minimal decay and, and, out, and wet setting can do just that, okay? Again, you can take things like, um, Let's take this here. Go into our... OK. 
And again, what you're hearing right now is just the sound of that ambient room. All right. Again, put it at 20%. And by the way, sometimes, you know, you, you, you might think, well, don't you want those balances to be at 100? Well, yes, because it's very common, especially if you've got something that's already mastered very, very loud. Um, if you're adding percentage on top of 100, you may go above zero. You may wind up clipping. So if you're keeping those balances within 100% total, less likely that you're going to have any clipped samples. This is something that you can also fix after the fact, too. Um, but just keep in mind, this also, again, allows me to bring that same that same very different sound into now a unified spatial environment and kind of glue things together a little bit more nicely. All right, so that's spatial ambient reverb to kind of glue things together, put them all in the same environment, particularly if you've got a lot of tracks that are very, very different. And as someone who compiles in the last year, I've already put out three or four releases on iTunes and Spotify, um, most of the stuff was recorded around the same time, but like even on this last record of mine, Just Play Music, Piano, Drum, and Vocals, um, there was one track that was recorded at a totally different time, different studio, different everything. And I had to, and I did in fact use a little ambient reverb similar to the reverbs I mixed everything else with just to kind of make it sound similar. It wasn't going to sound exact, but just, you know, somewhat similar. And it, and it worked. It worked nicely. Okay. Very cool. All right. Loudness, peak volume matching for compiling. All right. So this is probably one of the most um, asked about things that I hear all the time. How do I take a bunch of files and make them all the same peak level at one time? How do I take a bunch of files and make them all appear to be the same loudness, to have the same in-your-face quality so that I'm not having to readjust the volume when I'm listening back, okay? Now, as any good audio engineer will tell you, the only real way to do that is one by one, mastering them one by one, A being side to side. That's, that's the best practice, old school way to do it. Realities are that if, especially if you're working with video and you've got a whole series of, let's say, dialogue files or music files or doesn't matter what it is, and you want them all to kind of have the same, the same basic starting point, the same basic amplitude, this is a great way to very quickly compile and make all of your files the same apparent loudness or peak before you get started mixing and finishing. And to do that, we're going to use a panel in here called Match Loudness. And uh, it doesn't require any mastering knowledge whatsoever. This really does all the work for you, okay? So let's go into the Match Loudness panel. I'm gonna pull it up. Actually, I'm gonna pull it over here, dock it to the side. And I'm going to grab all of my files, and I'm gonna drag them into the Match Loudness panel. Now you'll see I just disabled this button here. I'm gonna turn it back on because what this will do is this is going to compute the loudness, the average volume, all of the, all of the things that we just saw in the amplitude statistics panel, this is now going to run on all of those files and it does it truly in like a couple of seconds, if that, based on how many files you have. So ready, let's go ahead and turn this on. Done, okay? And now it has figured out all of the attributes of your audio files, okay? So everything from, again, we're in the US here, so it's giving us our ITU uh, broadcast loudness standard. So based on this, I've got about one file, this scoring for games one. This is the only one that would be sort of legal for broadcast television. <laughs> we're not going there right now, but so it gives you the average loudness there, total RMS, the peak amplitude, and whoa, what's that one? Carry in. Whoa, look at that. The peak amplitude is like plus 16. Holy cow, what did I do? Um, so these are like all over the map. Minus 0.3, minus 0.7. Those are the ones that we fixed. Minus 5, minus 6, all right? The true peak, again, this is related to kind of broadcast loudness here. The perceived loudness, and then if there's any clipped samples, all right? So once you've analyzed all of that, now you can say, okay, what do I want to do with this? Do I want to ha just have everything peak at the same? I'm not. Again, I'm not... I don't want to deal with compression, limiting, adjusting dynamics. I just want to say, have everything peak. Nothing should peak above minus three. Like when I'm editing audio for video, particularly dialogue, all my dialogue, I will normalize everything to minus three. Because a lot of times when you're recording dialogue, someone either on a boom mic or a lab or something else, it's not uncommon, it's not uncommon 
to, um, you know, one speaker might peak at, you know, minus one. Then another speaker, maybe they're a bit of a soft talker. So their whole interview, it never peaks louder than minus 12. Well, this is a real drag when you're editing against video to have these huge ch changes and differences. So normalization is sometimes a good way just to start, just to get you started before you start mixing and messing around. So under match two, you'll see that you've got a whole series of options here. So if we wanted to do true uh, peak amplitude, or in the case of going out for broadcast with video, true peak, we could set the peak amplitude. We can say, okay, I want everything to peak at minus three and no more. Go ahead and run that. Done, okay? And now when we look at the attributes, every file has automatically uh, been set to minus three, okay? Every file automatically in just a second. So that's quite brilliant because now when we look at this and this and this and this and this, and this, and this, regardless. Now wait a minute. What was the carry in one? Oh, you know what? This must have. This must have some crazy. That's what it is. It's got a. That's what it is. It's got a clip at the end. This right here. Haha. -ha, I'm going. How? That, that that isn't minus three. Yes. You see that? So this is. This actually is a perfect segue, because here's the problem with normalization, <clears throat> or here's the here's the thing that people. It still kind of eludes users. Normalization looks at the loudest peak in a file, okay? So here I have all of this music, which currently, it's been mastered, is peaking in general because it's been limited around, it looks like minus 20, all right? But because it's got that one peak, that one little click at the very end, that was plus 16 dB above zero, when we normalized down, it had to take that loudest peak and globally make everything down to minus three, but it uses that peak here as the reference. So that kind of screwed everything up for us, right? That didn't help. So this is, again, had we just done a top and tail on this, and let's go ahead and do that right now. All right, I'm gonna fix that. Go to the beginning here and fix this one too. All right, zoom back out. So here, now you'll see everything is still gonna be minus 20, but if I were to actually normalize this to minus three, that's what we should have had. Right, and you can see very clearly there. Now, having said that, all right, the same exact thing can occur with dialogue. In fact, most commonly with dialogue, where you've got, again, someone very even-tempered, right? Yes, I find that uh, talking on mic is very easy and easy to keep my voice. Yes, no, totally. Oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> And then you've got this one moment where you have this huge transient peak that hits zero. Everything is minus 12, but that one transient peak is zero. Normalizing is not going to help you there. You're going to need to fix those peaks. You're going to need to fix those little transients before you normalize. Because otherwise, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to help you at all. So that's one of the main fundamental differences, again, between normalization and compression limiting. Normalization is just looking at the loudest peak as it exists. And if it's zero or plus 16 and you say, bring it down to zero, well, it's gonna attenuate everything by 16 dB. You don't necessarily want that. What you want really is that one peak to be where everything else is and then bring everything to zero. So you wanna keep in mind, you wanna look at that. And this, I didn't even expect that to happen, but that was perfect. That allowed me to solve that problem very quickly. So again, now if we were to go back in here and just rescan all these. They'll still all show minus three. Notice that the carry n one rescanned. It's minus three, but now its program loudness is more in line with what it should have been. Now, the other great use of this, let's say that we don't want to adjust peaks, but after we've done all of our um, compiling of all of our media, I actually want all of my dialogue to have the same loudness. I want it all to be around the same perceived loudness, perceived amplitude. This is where we can actually use one of our loudness standards or one of our traditional settings here. Now, I would recommend if you're doing any kind of video, you notice that we've got the EBU standard for European broadcasters, ATSC and ITU for here in the US and Canada. Um, you can use these and based on the target loudness that you set 
automatically conform all of your audio to a true broadcast standard loudness value. Now, if necessary, you'll see here that by making those adjustments, this will implement the tr a true peak limiter, our hard limiter, if necessary, okay? Um, and similarly, if you were to say, match to perceived loudness of minus six. Now again, this is now using the DBFS scale versus LUFS. If I set everything to minus six, which by the way is very loud, a perceived loudness of minus six RMS is super, super hot, um, it's going to do that. So let me go ahead and run this. And it's also going to, as you see the checkbox indicates here, use limiting if necessary. So now we are in fact adjusting uh, adjusting the uh, um, the relationships, the dynamic relationships of the audio. We are in fact limiting, i.e. limiting compressing the audio. We're changing the dynamics. So that's the difference again between uh, 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 compression limiting and normalization. Normalization doesn't touch dynamics, compression and limiting do. So now when we go back here, you can see that everything uh, has its sort of perceived loudness. Now again, these are the, it has to average over time, right? This is, this, is, this is not an absolute figure. So you can see here that these are all perceived around that minus six. Some go a little bit in and out because it's taking an average here. And I'm gonna show you in a moment how you can really um, measure that over time, okay? But this is how you can automatically get things sort of into the same range. This again can be very, very useful. As mentioned, if you are going to be going out to broadcast, all right, and you want everything to conform to a particular um, LUFS value, loudness units relative to full scale, in this case minus 23, go ahead and run all these again. This is now going to conform everything down to minus 23 LUFS. All right, and your waveforms are going to look very different now because again, they're all having their loudness levels around minus 23. All right, and you can see the waveforms all look somewhat very similar here. Um, and as we go into the details, and look at our loudness, you can see that everything now conforms to the minus 23 LUFS standard that we just implemented there. So the match loudness panel can be used to match peak levels, match global volume and loudness levels for music, or match global loudness volume levels based on ITU, EBU, and ATSC broadcast standards. Let's see, what else do we have here? Loudness radar, oh perfect. Now this was one of the things I was just saying. So. With regard to loudness, again, the way that you perceive things is it's consistent once you've implemented one of these standards. But keep in mind, of course, that it does, it, it's not sort of consistently ah, all the time, right? It does breathe a little bit. So if you actually want to visually get an idea of the program loudness of your audio, this is a panel that we have in both Premiere and Audition, which you can find under special called the loudness radar meter. That is so going to happen. <laughs> Let's hope not. I don't want to. I don't want to pour coffee on my hair, but I'm, I'll do it because it's bothering me so much. I'm very cramped in my interface this morning. All right. Okay. So if I just go ahead and play this for you. All right. This is now giving you a real time measurement. And again, this same panel uh, exists in both Premiere and App uh, and Audition. You'll see that I've even got a, a similar preset, because remember I set these to the EBU standard of minus 23. So I'm using the same preset here. Of course, you can readjust all of the various settings, your target loudness based on whatever standard. So I get asked this a lot, like we don't have a preset for the Japanese broadcast standard. Um, you can manually set those and create the preset for them. I, I don't know why, hopefully we'll see that added in the next version. Um, <clears throat> but this is going to give you a real time visual update. And again, based on this figure right here, if I'm a broadcaster, if I'm looking at, okay, does this fall within the legal limits of broadcast audio content? It does. I'm good to go. This is not going to get bounced by my broadcaster. I know that this is all legal, this is all legit, and I can deliver this with confidence. So having this loudness radar meter, you can use this again if we were also going to, you know, out to a CD master. This can be used for that too, just to kind of monitor what is that average loudness at all times. Where does it fall? This is a great way to monitor that live 
and um, <clears throat> and just again instill confidence that what you're delivering is um, is within legal broadcast limits or delivery limits. Okay, so that's the loudness radar meter. Doing well on time here, and in my last few minutes, had I not spilled coffee, I would have been right on the hour. But the last thing we're going to talk about here is metadata. So this is the stuff that you're going to add that's going to allow you to actually um, display all the necessary information in Spotify, in iTunes, when you deliver this content. And for broadcasters, this is one more way for them to archive and catalog and search on your media. So under the window menu, we have the metadata panel. Not unlike the metadata panel that you find in many other um, Adobe applications. And you'll see that you've got several different tabs. So with audio, not unlike video, there's a whole series of um, metadata standards that Audition supports and allows you to um, add media to. So BWF, that stands for your broadcast wave. So broadcast wave is the default linear PCM wave format natively supported in Audition. Broadcast wave files, or BWAV, very commonly referred to as BWAV or BWAV. Um, this is what they use in broadcast, right? And the fields that you pay attention to with broadcast wave description, originator, reference, origination date and time, UMID, and then some coding history. IXML, again, yet another um, variation, another uh, metadata uh, tagging standard, RIF. So this was for, uh, used to see, I guess they still use it, I guess, um, in uh, broadcast radio. For a while, briefly, uh, I believe in satellite radio, they were using this too. Um, this is still very much a standard, again, for commercial radio. CART, now CART Chunk, this was metadata that was um, specifically leveraged in clear channel managed broadcast stations here in the US. We were, used to work very closely with them and Audition was their editing platform of choice for years. So we have CART Chunk metadata built in here. And this again is all information that you can use to help the broadcaster sort and um, uh, uh, catalog your media. And then XMP. So this is the, the massive standard metadata that you'll see in Premiere that you can access in Bridge. You know, and this is everything. This is like every field of every conceivable metadata tag that you can add to content. And it's all here. And of course, you can access all of that in Audition. For iTunes, Spotify, and the like, you're going to focus on ID3 V2. And this is where you're going to put all that information that you need to, again, when you show up in iTunes or Spotify, the title, the artist, the album, the copyright date, the genre, the track number, the composer, all of these things are revealed in those environments. And it's really as simple as just typing in that information. Now, one thing that you want to keep in mind, you'll see that it actually gives you little tool tips on how to add the metadata. You must follow these tool tips, okay, exactly. Um, you do not want to, in other words, you want to follow what it's describing. So notice it says here for recording date, for example. You can put in 1964 or 8-10-64. You'll also notice um, when you create files from scratch, this will be, this will have like, it, it's it's actually more in a, a more elongated version of that 8-10-64. There's basically three methods that you can use in there. If you don't do it that way and you type something else, like what is today's date? It's the 5th. So if you type, you know, August 5th, it's not 19, 2016, um, this is going to break the metadata. And therefore, you're not going to see that recording date shown up. And you might not see other things too. So you want to follow whatever it is suggesting here. Now comments, that can be anything, that's just text. So that doesn't have to be formatted in any particular way. Genre, that's just choosing your genres from the dropdown or you can type in your own genre here. Track number, again, it's just going to follow a standard two digit uh, track number. Lyrics, same, there's no formatting here. Composer, no formatting, you can even have um, you know, your name slash someone else's name slash someone else's name. Part of a set, again, it gives you this example here. So this is when you have like a double disc configuration, which we don't, they still create, but we don't really do anymore because we don't, we're not, I mean, you can still buy CDs, but it's not like we're dealing with physical media. So, but if this is part of a set where you've got album one, album two, this would be one slash two. Very important that it's formatted that way. 
okay? And this tells you that right there, for example, one slash two, okay? So you wanna keep that formatting the same. Similarly, the remixer, again, just the name, the copyright here, it's just a date, and then the copyright URL. Now, it's funny, it doesn't actually have it here. This is just www or you know, your website, dot com, dot net, whatever. You do not want the HTTP colon slash slash in there. It will break the metadata, okay? So this is where you find that. And then when you're ready to get this out, export this to wherever, to whomever you're giving it to, export file, okay? Go to your file format. Now, if you're going to be delivering this to, uh, again, somewhere like, or SoundCloud or something like that, you can choose MP3. Notice here, and I'd like to point this out because we don't go in here a lot. Um, for those of you who do file sharing and things, we uh, support FLAC, we support ZIF AUG, uh, Monkey's Audio before FLAC kind of came, became the sort of lossless um, standard. Ape was kind of popular for a while there, quite a few years ago. AAC, Dolby Digital, if you're gonna be creating Dolby standard AC3 or EC3 files. Um, MPEG-2, a lot of broadcasters still use MPEG-2. And keep in mind that each one of these will have different um, format parameters that you can modify. So like if you go into MPEG-1 layer 2, see so you've got your various um, channel modes, the various bit rates that are supported. <clears throat> Notice MPEG-2 goes up to 384 at 44.1. And then you've got some additional advanced settings, you know, like emphasis. We talked about this in another stream. This is from the early digital days. You know, you shouldn't have to de-emphasize anything anymore. But a lot of people who still use MPEG-2 audio, the masters came from early 48K digital masters that had emphasis. So that's how you de-emphasize when you go to MPEG-2. So again, you just choose the format that you want. If you're going to be delivering to something like um, <clears throat> a digital distributor or bringing this back into Premiere, I would of course recommend use, using Wave PCM, Broadcast Wave, or AIF if you want. You don't see, I don't see AIF files used as much because now PCM Wave is kind of the standard on both Mac and Windows, you know? It just kind of happened that way. So again, we'd keep this at 4416 or um, the, this is a native 16-bit file, so yeah, I wouldn't necessarily change it. You could also just say, you know, same as source, and that'll make everything whatever that source bit rate is and export it out. And you just want to make sure that this box is checked, include markers and other metadata, so that all that information there is preserved when you export. And of course, going to MP3, if you're going to be adding these files to your music library, you absolutely want to make sure that that's checked as well. Now, once you've done that, let's actually, let's do a really quick one here. I'm just a couple minutes over and I'll just, I'll show you very briefly. All right, so I'm just gonna co copy this to a new file. Okay, so here it is. Notice it took all of my, um, all of my information here and the comment can be, this was recorded live in studio, January, February, 2000, Scottsdale, Arizona, okay? And you can say that this is track one, the composer is me, whatever, etc. You get all this other stuff here. Uh, no lyrics, instrumental only. Okay, let's go ahead and save this. There, silver piece 01. It is 44, MP3, 320, all good. Let's go ahead and put this on the desktop. Okay, it just saved all of that. So now that I've just created that file, if I go over to iTunes, all right, and uh, oh, and look at there, there's, there's the iTunes store with all of my offerings. What was the chances of finding that there? That's odd. If we go into my music, let's go up to uh, add to library, desktop, let's go into silver piece MP3. All right, and we'll just go to recently added. So there it is. Oh, I didn't even realize I, the album was called Buddha Jew Originals Live. So if we just look at this and look at the information, okay, so now you can see it took all of the metadata that we wrote here, and there it is. So it's song name, artist, album, composer, the year, there's my comments, again, under lyrics, no lyrics, instrumental only. Now for artwork, while you can't add that in Audition, we can say add artwork here. And if we go to my desktop, I've got my cover. Now, traditionally you want, um, your digital distribution services want something that's uh, 1400 by 1400 pixels. I usually do artwork for iTunes. 
at about a thousand by thousand. It has to be square. It doesn't have to be. It should be square, though. That's going to conform to the size that they prefer displaying. Thousand by thousand pixels. I usually do about 70% quality. This is actually the proposed back cover for the vinyl version of my Just Play Music uh, EP that I released back in March. Um, but now this has that uh, image tied to the MP3. So check this out. Let me show this in Finder. You can actually see here that the file, the MP3 that we exported out of Audition with the artwork added in iTunes, that artwork is now stitched to that MP3. So if I go ahead and give this to somebody, they don't have to bring it into iTunes, that artwork is there. So that's kind of cool, right? So you have this ability to add the artwork easily. It's got all the metadata that you added, and you now know that you've prepped your file properly for iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, broadcast video, wherever it's going with uh, those uh, six or seven simple steps. So thank you so much for watching this episode of Audio 101. We'll see you next time.